Good evening, everyone. Welcome. My name is Joe Davich. I'm the Executive Director here at the Georgia Center for the Book. And on behalf of the Georgia Center for the Book, DeKalb County Public Libraries, and our neighbors at the South Carolina Center for the Book, welcome to another in our continuing series of author events. So, we in the library have made it through summer reading. <laughs> If, if you would see our circulation reclamation room upstairs, it is a wash of returned books and books on hold. It is amazing that our library staff manages to check in, check out, and, and make everybody happy. Uh, but it has been an interesting day since school starts on Thursday, to say the least. Um, that being said, we have a fantastic August coming up for you. And of course, as you know, that leads right into the Decatur Book Festival. So a few things of note, Thursday, August 1st, we are going to have a reading here in this very room. The author's name is Erica C. Whitsell. She has written a debut novel called Give. It, like all things Southern, is a family story that is full of twists, turns, and skeletons in the closet. <laughs> um, exactly, but you know, it's the South, so sometimes we drag those skeletons right out onto the front porch where everybody can see it. <laughs> so that is Thursday at 7.15 p.m. August 6th, we are very, very excited um, to have another launch for you. Kimberly Jones, who is the former manager of Little Shop of Stories, and her friend Jilly Siegel have written a book called I Am Not Dying With You Tonight. It is a young adult novel, but it is so very, very timely. It is a story of two girls who go to the same high school. One is black and one is white, and they are not friends at all. But they are put into an extreme situation that takes place um, during a football game at a high school. And like the title implies, they quickly have to learn to, get, learn to work together to get through the events of the evening. Um, we are so pleased to host this. I always love it when new Georgia authors launch their books right here in Decatur. So 7.15 on August 6th for that. Um, also, August 20th, Karen Slaughter is launching her new Will Trent novel for all of you Will Trent fans out there. He is returning in The Last Widow on August 20th. And on August 21st, we are once again hosting what I love to call Literary Fight Club. It is our <laughs> fall book preview. The reason why I call it Literary Fight Club is everybody keeps telling everyone about this event. And last year we had about 140 people. So that's 25 more than the year before and 25 years than the year before that. So we have one more year of 25 people, and after that there will be no more seats in the auditorium. <laughs> but if you haven't come to this event, what it is, is representatives from Random House, Penguin Books, Knopf, Doubleday, come and tell you all about the great titles, the exciting titles, the little hidden gems that are being published from September through the first of the year. What makes it equally exciting in Like a Fight Club is that you will get <laughs> free stuff. So, very much like what I do on a daily basis, the publishers will be here offering you what we call galleys, or advanced reading copies of some of the titles coming out. There are some quaint little book bags that you will get to take home as well, and we'll have some raffles for some one-off prizes and things like that. That is August 21st. Now, just a few other quick notes. Of course, the Decatur Book Festival is coming up, and we are getting ready for that. And we are so pleased that we will once again be a site to distribute book festival keynote tickets. So on August 12th is when the keynote tickets go on sale. We will have 40 tickets at our circulation desk for you to come and grab. Once the 40 are gone, the 40 are gone. So we open up at 9 a.m. So if you want <laughs> keynote tickets, 9 a.m. On, on August 12th. Also, we will be hosting not one, but two documentary screenings here at the library for the book festival. We are very, very pleased that on Friday, August 30th, we will once again show the Lillian Smith documentary, Breaking the Silence. This is, of course, the final cut of the film that has been developed from the screenings that we did at the library here in May, um, and it is getting ready to go out to festival season for awards and prizes. So if you didn't get a chance to see it in May when we had our screenings, now is your chance to see the very, very final cut before it gets released to the world. 
Also, Out on Film is partnering with the Book Festival, and on Saturday, we are showing a film called Trans Military. It is about the 15,000 transgendered individuals that are serving actively in our military to this very day. It is a very interesting film. If you are not familiar with the, these folks that are out there that are serving in silence still in 2019, please do find tickets for that, as well as the William Smith documentary on Eventbrite. Grab your tickets before they're gone. I posted them today, and there are already seven gone. So they tend to leave in groups and fast. So do plan ahead for that. Um, what time are those going to be? 7 p.m. both times. Okay. Yeah, 7 p.m. And the library will actually be closed, so just like tonight, enter through the lower level where doors for us. So, speaking of Georgia authors, we are here tonight to listen to someone talk about a book and not only honor Georgia author, but her mother at the same time. We're very pleased to have Terry Wynn here tonight to talk about her mother's book, Through My Eyes, A Lifetime, Re Lifetime of Memory Southern Style, that of course was written by her mother and ready for publication before she passed. It is now in book form for us all to enjoy and hear about her life in South Carolina and in Georgia and around the world. But that is not my story for you to tell. That is Terry's to tell and to further honor her mother. So would you please join me to welcome this evening, Terry Wynn. Thank you. This is my mother, Carolyn Taylor Wynn, and I'm her youngest daughter. And tonight, I'd like to talk to you about her book, tell you information that's not in the book, make some comparison between yesteryear and today, and hopefully encourage you to write your own memories. So, how did this book come about? My mother lived both in South Carolina, where she was born, later moved to Georgia, where she wrote her book, she was a corporate accountant for 30 years, and after she retired, she decided to take enrichment courses for senior citizens, including art, drawing, and creative writing. She really liked that creative writing class, so she took it multiple times, and the assignments were always the same. Write about a favorite childhood memory, and inevitably, my phone rang and I heard, Terry, will you put this assignment on your computer for me? <laughs> so I got to read them. As the years went by, I read more and more, and I was simultaneously fascinated, charmed, and entertained. So I encouraged her, write even more, and would you record them for me? So. We decided, once she had enough, to contact a publisher and send him the actual writings as well as the recordings. He immediately offered her a publishing contract, and she immediately accepted. <laughs> so the work began, and the publisher guided her and said, what would you like for your book cover? So she did her research, and she found that many of the covers of bestsellers, including the Thorn Birds, remember that famous book, had an orangish background with black lettering. So she decided she wanted an orangish background <laughs> <laughs> with a little girl sitting in a rope swing hanging from a tree silhouetted against this orangish background. So she actually drew the cover art, and I'd like to show you how the publisher himself translated her original cover art into the actual cover. Would you like to see? Yes. Good. I was hoping you'd say that. <laughs> you remember I said that she took courses in art and drawing. This is one of her original drawings of the farmhouse where she grew up. She got quite good after a while. This is the drawing of the little girl in the swing. And these little doodads are supposed to be moths, which didn't end up in the final drawing. <laughs> so through InDesign and Photoshop, the publisher was able to put the little girl directly into the swing, 
Now keep your eye on the swing. He crops out the farmhouse. He changes it to black and into a silhouette. Now, he kept showing this orangish background. So to tell him what kind of orange we wanted, a soft muted orange, we sent him this photograph that is taken from a trip my mother and I took together to Tahiti. This is actually the view from my balcony, so if you haven't been to Tahiti, by all means go. And we just thought he was going to use this orange as a guide for what the background would look like. But here's what he did. He actually took that and put it right into the photograph. Can you see? Let me go back a minute. Can you see? The palm fronds right here, he had to crop those out. And he made more cropping and more color adjustments. And then he raised the ground so it would have some depth. And there's the final picture. I thought it was very effective. Then with the front and the back flaps, and the, there's the final cover. What do you think? I, I thought it was beautiful. I keep encouraging the publisher to enter it in a book cover contest, but I haven't succeeded yet. <laughs> so the work continues. Now the publisher says, he thinks my mother needs to organize all of her vignettes into parts. So she puts them in chronological order, and these are the parts in her book. Part one is Life in South Carolina as a Country Girl, where she was born in the small town of Ridgeland, South Carolina, about 30 miles from Savannah on the South Carolina side. She moved to Georgia after she married and had three children, and that's part two, Life in Atlanta as a Southern Lady. Then part three is Life with a Passport. She was lethal as an international traveler. <laughs> Part four, life among relatives, her legacy of memories. And then her afterwards, life through my eyes, my reflections. And I'd like to talk to you about each of these parts. Now, is that not a cute little South Carolina, southern country girl in front of her farmhouse where she was born and lived till she was about six? There was no running water, there was no electricity, and they had an outdoor privy. But when she was about six, she moved to the first house in the county that had running water and electricity. She was so proud. <laughs> and I'm sure that they were very relieved to have an indoor privy. <laughs> One of her advanced reviewers says that she transport readers deep into rural South Carolina and connect the smells, the taste, and the sensations of the times. Let's talk about the taste. Food was always an important part of the South. It certainly was for my family. Was it for yours? It still is a very important part. <laughs> she writes about Easter dinner as a child, and here's what she writes. There was a whole baked ham glazed and studded with cloves. Not to mention the fried chicken, the tossed salad with avocados, the ginger ale congealed salad, the vegetables, and our favorite dessert, floating island. So let's stop a minute. This is the South. I always wondered about dinner. Is dinner the lunch meal or the evening meal? So let's see a show of hands. How many people think it's the lunch meal? On Sunday. The lunch meal, if it's Sunday, it's the lunch meal. How many people think it's the supper meal? The, what I call the evening meal. Well, actually, I looked it up in the dictionary because like you, I wasn't sure either. And it says it's the main meal of the day. It doesn't specify a time. So that was interesting to me. Now we know dinner is whenever you eat your big meal, whatever that is. <laughs> now she writes about Floating Island as her favorite dessert. I've never heard of this. Has anybody ever heard of it? Yeah, I didn't have it until I was about 25. I don't but, think of that as a southern thing. Well, do, do, who, would you share what this is? Well, it's, it's been years since I had it, but it's like I think of this really good sauce, and it's like a meringue thing floating in the middle of it. And I don't remember what else might have been on it, but it was delicious. 
It's a sort of a custard dish with dollops of meringue that look like individual islands on it. I mean, oddly enough, my mother, who was an excellent cook, never fixed it for us. I'd never heard of it. I'd never had it. <laughs> How many people have actually eaten it? Yeah. A, a few of you have had it. Is, and you, is it good? It's very good. Okay, we'll have to try it. Floating island. <laughs> now to continue... At Easter, she says, no matter how much we practice, none of us were able, ever able to pip like my father. This is something else. I never heard of pipping. How many people have ever heard of pipping? You have. Would one of you like to say what it is? You never heard of it. You never heard of it? Nobody knows what it is. All right, well, let me demonstrate. You take two real hard-boiled eggs. Use your imagination. <laughs> Each person holds one, and you take the pointed ends, click them together, and if your egg cracks, you're the loser. <laughs> well, <laughs> you're holding out on us, so you knew all, all about it all the time. <laughs> what do you call it? Cracking the eggs. <laughs> well, now we know the Greeks crack the eggs and the Old South pits. Well, thanks for letting me know. Hey, by the way, can you give us any pointers on how to win when you pip? Well, you have to hold it just right. I know you have a hardball egg that's got a good shell on it. I just wondered if you want a, a real pointed one or not pointed, if you hold it near the end or not. And she, but, okay, the answer is you have to hold it just right, but we're going to have to Google it to find out how to win. Okay. Well, I told you I'd like to do some comparisons. So let's stop here and do some comparisons. If you celebrate Easter, how many people even still dye eggs? Okay, some people. Okay, the, the church does it, okay. Hear it for the Greeks. How many people just buy plastic eggs for their children, grandchildren? They do that too. They don't like boiled eggs that much. Growing up, we love boiled eggs. Especially if you teach them how to pip, then they'll love the boiled <laughs> eggs more. And how many people just buy the candy and eat it if you practice? Oh, yes. <laughs> I see that hand over there. <laughs> Thanks for being honest about it. She had her three children, and when I was a year old, my father was transferred to Atlanta, and she moved to Atlanta, and this country girl became a southern lady. <laughs> now, I'd like to compare what I remember, because now I'm in this part, and I can tell you more about it. Food was a very important part of our life. My mother was such a good cook that all of her friends encouraged her to open her own restaurant. Now what she fixed was not low cal, it was not low fat, it was not low salt, it was not low sugar, it was probably deadly, <laughs> but it was good. Yeah. And here's a typical Sunday dinner, what I had most every Sunday of my life that I could remember. Fried chicken, homemade fried chicken, white rice with homemade giblet gravy, <laughs> Homemade biscuits, yes, from Crisco, with, served with real butter and jelly, butter beans, one or two vegetables, don't ask me what they were because I was concentrating on those biscuits and the homemade banana pudding served hot out the oven with meringue on top. Now, on just a regular Sunday dinner, do you, you, I had two or three people raise their hand to say yes, they still fix a good meal on Sunday dinner. Is that correct? Let me see that show of hands. Do you still fix, not Easter dinner, just every Sunday? No, but not anymore. Well, this is what I remember every Sunday of my life growing up, and not anymore. How many people go out to eat for Sunday dinner? Okay. So it's a couple of hands going out to eat, and then there's the people that just, it's just a normal lunch, whatever you eat for lunch, and I don't need to know. <laughs> That's your business. So times have changed. 
I didn't get to eat this every day when it came time for me on Monday as a little toddler to have my lunch. Here's what my mother fixed me. <laughs> Butter and sugar sandwiches on white bread. Now what doctor would approve of this? Did anybody eat this besides me? You did, where does this recipe come from? Where did they I get it? I've got a northerner that ate the same thing I did. I have no idea where it came from, but two or three of you raised your hands. You ate it too. I have no idea where this came from. Did anybody eat anything any more unhealthy than that? Like peanut butter and jelly. Peanut butter and jelly, but that's kind of common, and I think a lot of people did. Uh, Anyway, that's, I wish I knew where that recipe comes from. Please get word to me. If anybody finds out, I'd love to know. When I was sick, especially with the stomach flu or virus, I was always given chicken noodle soup and saltines. Not this brat diet, which the doctors recommend, of bananas, <laughs> rice, applesauce, and toast. I still eat Chicken noodle soup and saltines. All right, let's see. How many people do brat and how many do chicken noodle soup? How many people do chicken noodle soup when they're sick? Everybody. The brat diet? I don't care what the doctors say. We're sticking with the old stuff, right? The chicken noodle soup and the saltines, right? Okay. Have I made you hungry? If y'all didn't eat before you came, I, I am so sorry. I know you're hungry. I want that hot banana pudding, too. Well, let's switch topics so you won't starve. <laughs> In my book, my mother wrote, for years, I received many calls intended for the other Carolyn T. Wynn from the nature of the calls and the many invitations to go partying. I decided she must have been a very popular lady. As a child, I was not allowed to answer the phone for fear it might be one of these male callers. <laughs> the years go by, my mother's a senior citizen, I've moved out and I go to visit her. The phone rings. I knew it was one of those calls because here's what she did. You have the wrong number and slam the phone down. <laughs> now, in terms of comparison, I just want to point out, you can't do that with a cell phone. Just, just, <laughs> just, just, you know, times have changed. It's not as much fun. You just can't do it. Anyway, I could not resist. Mom, what did he say to you? She said, <laughs> he asked me if I was still wearing my specific article of clothing. <laughs> now you can imagine how infuriating and offensive this was to my Southern Baptist moral, religious, spiritual mother whose Bible looks like this. <laughs> In fact, when I was a child, I was not allowed to say the popular slang of the day. Holy cow. <laughs> My mother considered that sacrilegious. <laughs> she somehow always knew if any of us kids did something wrong. We never found out how, but we asked her and she said, I have eyes in the back of my head. <laughs> Who heard this from their parents? <laughs> Do mothers go to the mom school of mothering and they change their curriculum every 10 years and they all learn the same things to say? How do they know? Now, I'm going to tell my child this. Now, you tell your child this. How do they know? <laughs> anyway. My mother was very good at interior decorating. She was also a fastidious housekeeper. Let me tell you how fastidious. 
she had to have her knee replaced. And I took a month of paid family leave to take care of her. When I arrived before the surgery, she greeted me and pointed to this huge pasteboard box on the dining room table. I thought, she must have gotten me a gift. <laughs> In it were Windex, Comet, Pledge. <laughs> and she said, and just for you, I got a brand new bottle of toilet bowl cleaner. <laughs> Thanks, Mom. You know, every child's dearest gift. <laughs> she was going to make sure her house was clean one way or another. She was a multitasker. She prided herself. I can work a crossword puzzle. I can watch TV. I can hold a conversation all at the same time. But she had a way to get all of this done. See if you identify. Like most families, we all sat around and watched TV. You did that too, right? Okay. But the minute anybody stood up, you could expect three words from my mother. While you're up. <laughs> would you bring me the sewing box, the scotch tape, and the scissors? We used to sit and everybody would, the siblings would wait each other out. Now, I don't care how bad you had to go to the bathroom, you just sat like this. Maybe, maybe one somebody else would have to get up first because you know you're going to have to traipse all over the house for my mom. Now how many people had parents that did this too? And how many people say this to their spouse and their own siblings and their own children? Oh, be honest. Thank you. Again, the mom's school of mothering, I'm telling you, they must go to it. Now, I mentioned that we watched TV as a family, and one of our favorites was the Andy Williams show. You watched it too. You remember dark hair, blue eyes, sang Moon River. You know, we all fell in love with him, didn't we? Well, when my mother was a senior citizen and Andy was a senior citizen, he came to Atlanta and we got tickets. My mother wasn't feeling well, so she's diagnosed with having had a small stroke. But it's Andy Williams, and by golly, she's going to go. Now, she kept her eyes closed most of the concert, but this is her actual program and her actual ticket stub. She was proving she actually went to see Andy Williams. He was a senior citizen, and so was she. And she was quite vivacious and playful. And people just boldly would say, Carolyn, how old are you? She got used to it and began to expect it. So she would say, with a smile on her face that was mischievous and twinkle in her eye, she'd say, oh, I don't discuss my age, and I don't discuss my weight, and I don't discuss my love life. <laughs> and I can't remember if on occasion she might have said her sex life. <laughs> But it, it allayed the questioner enough that she got out of it. Well, when she reached the last decade of her life, the first year of that last decade, her closest friend gave her a surprise birthday party under the premise it was just a summer party. I was invited. And when her close friend said why, she said it's because of she's reached this age. And I said, but she doesn't think anybody knows her age. <laughs> How'd you find out? She said, she told me. So, uh, <laughs> mothers. <laughs> My mother loved to play. The first ones we saw were in Las Vegas, and you could play a nickel. Okay, that was fun for me. I would, I would gamble a couple of dollars. But those quickly disappeared, and I can't find them anywhere. And the next closest are the quarter machines. Well, that's past my budget, <laughs> but not my mother's. She would take extra coins and, and extra money every trip to play these machines. So I'm sitting watching her, and she says, 
come on, Terry, I want you to play too. And I said, no, I'd rather use my money on a souvenir. Oh, come on, I want you to play. Come on, come on. Here's some quarters. Come on. I let her talk me into playing. And lo and behold, I won some. <laughs> you know, not a whole lot, but anything is great for me. So I said, okay, I'll keep the earnings and you just take back what you gave to me. No, I want you to play them. Come on, come on, it's fun. Go ahead, go ahead. Y'all sound like you understand this. <laughs> you played these, I guess. She wasn't happy till I lost every single quarter. <laughs> and she had lost every single quarter. And then she was ready to go. And when we got home, I bought her her own little handheld slot machine. She's going to love this. She never played with it. And when I asked her why, do you know what she said? It doesn't make the musical sounds and the tinkle, tinkle, tinkle sound of little toys coming down when you win. So you now know she was a good cook, she was moral and religious, she was very strong-willed. If anybody has a small stroke and still goes to see Andy Williams, she's a, she was a fastidious housekeeper. She was very playful, loved to travel, loved to listen, and loved to tell a good story herself. But one thing she loved even more was her family and her relatives. This is my mom. Do you think we look alike? I'd like to actually read to you one of my favorite that she writes about, about relatives. She doesn't write about every single relative. There's just too many, but she wrote about some memorable ones. Would you like to hear like a one-page passage? Good. Aunt Lily. I never met Aunt Lily. I remember Lily Gray Thomas, my grandfather Gray's child from his first marriage. She was the best cook in the world. When she made toast, she even took time to spread the butter to the crust on both sides of the bread. After having poor sight for some years, Aunt Lily lost all of her sight. She couldn't tell night from day. One time I visited Aunt Lily at the Baptist Village in Waycross, Georgia. When she was told who I was, she arose gracefully from her chair and hugged me. Then. Starting at the top of my head, she began to see me. I realized as her fingers moved over my face, the cheekbones, the ears, the lips, down my arms and around my waist, that she could tell many things. Wrinkles, weight loss, or gain. I think she could even determine the state of my health and whether I was happy or sad. Her lunch was brought in and I marveled at her ability to tell how hot her coffee was and where the meat as well as other food was on her plate. She explained that the same type of food was always put in the same place on the plate like numbers on a clock dial. She didn't spill a single thing. I noticed the family portraits and some other familiar things that I had seen over the years. She too must have been aware of them. I left with a good feeling. She escorted me to the door, not bumping into a single object. Now I understand how the blind can see. very ending of my mother's book is her afterwards. Life through my eyes, my reflection. That's Carolyn and her reflection. I sincerely hope that you do not hang mirrors on the outside of your home. <laughs> I asked her about this and, and she said it was just for the picture. <laughs> 
I hope so. <laughs> Her afterword is only one page, and I don't want to spoil it for you. But I'd like to tell you about my afterword. As you know, my mother completed her book before she died, and it was actually published after she died. When it was published, I was cleaning out many, many file folders. One in particular was labeled Mom's Signature. She knew she was dying. She had lung cancer, but never smoked, but she knew she was making the best of her life. So we sent these copies of her signature to the publisher so he could pre-print it in every single book. When I looked in this file folder, I found this misshapen note I'd never seen before from my mother. Hello, Terry, and thank you for doing all the hard work on our Through My Eyes. May yours be even better than this one. Oh. Love and more love, Mom. Four things are very peculiar about this note. This is the South. She would never say hello. It was hey or hi or Terry. But hello, that's way too formal for her. She would never have started with and, she would have just started with thank you. On our, she flat out said to me many times, this is my book and I'm doing it my way. There was no hour about it. And she would have written out through. Now friends say, well you probably just forgot you had that note. Or, she slipped it in the file when you weren't looking. But I know neither one of those is true. Does anybody want to offer their speculation? Okay. Then let me draw. I, I don't know either. All I can tell you is I framed it, this little misshapen piece of scratch paper. May yours be even better than this one. I invite each of you to write your own book of memoirs. Wouldn't you love to read your great-grandparents, find out what life was like for them? For two reasons, I invite you to write your own. One is to leave a legacy and start that tradition. And number two, in choosing the people and the experiences in your life, you'll find the events and people that gave your life meaning. How many people will commit to yourselves, not to me, but to yourselves, that you will write your own memoirs? <laughs> I'm, I have one taker back here. That's good. You can write them. You can word process them. You can get your child to put them on the computer. If you want to self-publish, fine. You don't have to publish. You can just record like my mother did. Um, my friend says her mother's handwritten memories are what she likes. But you have the stories. You don't want to hand them down. Or are you saying your children just aren't interested? I really encourage you to do it for yourself so you can find those events that gave your life meaning. If you want to see more pictures and photos about the people and places and things in my mother's book, you can visit her website and there is a contact form there. If you choose to read her book, I'd love to hear what you think about it. And if you give me permission, we put your comments on the website. But I'd also like for you to let me know if you do write your own memories, or at least some of them, because I'd like to know what life is like through your eyes. I've done all the talking. Let's hear from you. Who has a question? Yes. Have you written your own memoir? 
I've started them and I've changed my mind on how I'm going to do with them as opposed to just the experiences. I want to find, write the lessons and then go back and write the experience that taught me that lesson. Hers, my mother's, are more of her mishaps. That's what she enjoyed writing about with a laugh at myself punchline at the end. So she has short vignettes all through hers. So if you want to learn to laugh at yourself, hers is a great book to do that with. <coughs> Who else has a question? Yes. You said you're the youngest. How many children? She had three children. Right? Correct. So you have a brother, sister, or brother? I have, there were three of us yeah. all together. But I mean, all girls or a boy? Or? The oldest was a girl, and then a boy, and then me. Okay. I knew you were the baby. How'd you know that? Well, you said that. I did. That's a good way to know. <laughs> you have a keen perception of the obvious, don't you? <laughs> Who else has a question? Well, tell us something about your daddy. You know, it's interesting. My mother wanted this book to be about her and not my father. So she intentionally made it all about her. <laughs> and there's very little in it. Very little in it about him. Um, I'll tell you a short little just not in the book something about my dad that I'm very proud of. Before they moved to Atlanta my dad was a semi-pro, I don't know if it's baseball or softball pitcher and he also enjoyed boxing. When he came to Atlanta uh, one of the jobs he took was in a credit department and this man came in jumped over the ledge that keeps clients from the people working there and he said, I'm sick and tired of you people trying to bother me about my credit. And he reached back to hit my father. <laughs> and my father floored him. <laughs> and, and he was um, well over 50. I was really proud of him. And he said, <laughs> he said his supervisor came out dragging a lead pipe. I don't know what he was going to do with the pipe if he couldn't even pick it up. Um, now, my father would not hit somebody but he, he knew how to defend himself from his boxing day. So if that tells you a little bit about my father, and I, there was no discipline to my father. Even they were proud that he took care. And the man from the floor said, you hit me. <laughs> yeah, it was you or me. So that tells you a little bit about my father. He loved his kids too. Who else has a question? Yes. Was it very difficult for you to, you know, that, that time after your mom's passing, you know, you had been with her through this book, through this experience, you had traveled with her, how, how, how difficult it was for you? Was it difficult for me after my mother died? It was very difficult. They say most people grieve for about a year. It was two or three for me. and. It took a lot of experiences, and how I finally overcame it is an interesting story. My neighbor said, would you please reach up and reach down under the bed and get some things for me? And my knees had been hurting. I said, no, I can't. And I went back inside, and I thought, you could have done that for her. You could have done that. What's wrong with you? And I thought, you've got to get out of this feeling sorry for yourself. Pick yourself up and get over it. It's time. And that little incident was a turning point for me. But it did take quite a while, yes. Any other questions? Okay, we'll just take one or two more. Yes. Do you have children? I never met Mr. Wright, so I didn't want to raise any children on my own, but I do love children, but I have none. I have to figure out who wants my book of memoirs. <laughs> Y'all contact me if you think you want to read my book, so I'll have somebody to send it to. Any other questions? Terry, I'll read your book and see if what you say is right. <laughs> my friend from Greece and I have known each other for years, and she means what she says. <laughs> Any others? Then I would like for you to see a tribute to my mother, Carolyn Taylor Wynn. In, this is a photographic tribute. You can also see this on her website, and I hope you enjoy it. <laughs> 